Hello and welcome to the Science Fiction and Fantasy Marketing Podcast, the show where we help you establish your author brand, increase the size of your audience, and sell more books. I'm Lindsay Baroker, and I'm here with Jeffrey Poole and Joe Lalo, and we've got a good guest for you this week, Drew Hayes. He comes to us from Texas, and he's the author of the Spells, Swords, and Stealth trilogy. Well, there's three books. I guess we'll have to ask him if it's a, officially a trilogy, and uh, the Super Powered series, and several stand standalone adventures. He's also one of the hosts of the Authors and Dragons podcast. And uh, I shortened up the bio reading portion there. So Drew, why don't you tell us about yourself since I always stumble over it anyway? Uh, sure, glad to. Uh, as Lindsay mentioned, I do the Super Powered series. Spells, Swords, and Stealth is, there are three books out, but it is not uh, a trilogy in that there are more books to come. Uh, I've also done a series called Fred the Vampire Accountants. Um, and a couple of standalones, and then of course there's the new series launching this month. And yes, I do Authors and Dragons with a bunch of other fun authors like Robert Bevan, Rick Gilterry, and John Hartness. It's us playing D and D, and we're terrible at it. Do you actually do it on the podcast, or are you just talking about it? No, it's I mean we it's us. So we play the game, and then we record us, and then we just sort of edit that down and podcast it out. I mean, we take out the part where we're trying to figure out how grapple works and sort of just keep it on the funny bits they do because it's like trying to herd chickens. All right, that sounds interesting. Yeah, I'm glad there's a little editing since, uh, I don't know, you guys probably play for five or six hours at a time, I would guess. Uh, no, we keep it down to a trim two and a half to three at maximum because most of them have kids and lives and that's that's just what we can squeeze in. So the episodes rarely go over 130. All right. Well, that sounds interesting. Uh, why don't you tell us about about your writing and what made you? I think you're self-published, right? You had a uh, what do you call it? A publishing company on your yes. Amazon page, but I never know for sure if that's a small press or a self-published. Uh, so I'm hybrid. I'm uh, indie or self-published for most of my series: um, Super Powered, Spell Sword and Stealth, uh, all of my standalones, and then the new series are all indie. Uh, I do have a publishing company I put things under just, you know, for branding called Thunder Pair Publishing. I named it after the least popular character in my worst selling book at the time. Um, and then I also work with a small press called Roots Publishing for the Fred the Vampire Accountant series. All right, cool. Yeah, that sounds like a, a good idea. I'm always trying to figure out what to name a publishing company or all ever important what your license plate should be when you go for the vanity plate. Oh, I haven't cracked that one yet. That's a good and you, one. I can't ever fit any of my character names on there because I have these long fantasy names. So, <laughs> All right. I should point out for those listening that Drew has sold quite a few books. It looks like, you know, from the reviews are in the hundreds on some of them. And you don't look like you're, I mean, you're prolific, but you don't look like you're publishing a book every month. Like uh, we've had guests on the show doing that. So do you want to tell us a bit how, how things are going and how you're you know, we'll ask you more about marketing later, but um, yeah, give us a little more. Sure, sure. Um, so in general, I always try to have three books come out every year. Um, so I'm definitely not doing a book a month or anything like that. Uh, but they are pretty large. They are, I think, Super Powers, which was my first main book, was around 200,000 words. Uh, and then up to year three was about 300,000. And most of them, well, a lot of them swing around that range. So it's it's a lot of output. Um, I'm actually sort of finding a second life in audio sales because for one credit, people are getting like 30 hours worth of book. And that's been a, a huge boon and gotten me a little bit more momentum in that arena. And I've also worked with a great audio house called Tantor who has amazing narrators that really breathe life into it. I Full credit goes to those guys. They, they really have helped that area out. Um, but aside from that, I sort of spread myself wide across a couple of genres. I do superhero. I do uh, fantasy. I think the Spell, Swords, and Stealth series might be lit RPG. I've I've never met people with uh, the exact same definition of what that entails. So it might be fantasy. It might be lit RPG. I, I honestly don't know for sure. Um, and then Fred the Vampire Count is urban fantasy mixed with satire. So I'm a little all over the place, but I'm going back to my roots with the next series for superheroes. And then I've got one about a god stuck in a pair. So, you know, hitting all the main bases. All right. You're kind of going against a lot of the advice that is commonly given out there to sort of stick to one niche. You know, you're, they're all seem to sound like they're under the fantasy umbrella, but, you know, I know it can be a different audience for the epic, I guess, it lit RPG from the 
urban fantasy and superheroes. What are your what are your thoughts here? Do you just write whatever excites you or do you have a master plan? Um, I'd say for some of my series, there is a plan. Master might be giving it a little more credit than I really warrant. But nine times out of 10, I think books for me come from either ideas that I think are really fun or things that I super want to see exist, but I can't actually find anywhere. So like superpowers came about because I love superheroes. Like that's, that's one of my favorite genres growing up. I've always just been super, oh wow, that was a poor choice of words, but I've always been super into them. Um, and it sort of annoyed me a little bit that I could, and bear in mind, this is 2008, that options have exploded since then. Um, but I could always find stories that really focused on the power aspect or the human aspect, but not ones that really did a great job mixing and matching, like talking about these people in terms of their humanity and their incredible abilities. And so I set out trying to write that. And whether it was accomplished or not is up to personal interpretation, but uh, that was my goal with that series. Whereas Fred the Vampire Accountant was more of me sort of uh, pushing back. I got I got a little burned out on urban fantasy, which is also a genre I love, but I, I just felt like for a while, a lot of the story started falling into the same formula of a uh, person is bad at life, person resists the super, or person becomes supernatural, person resists it initially, uh, they embrace it, and then they're just the baddest mofo east, west, and north of the Rio Grande. And I wanted to do a book about the idea that changing what you are doesn't change who you are. So I wrote about a guy who is socially anxious and better with numbers than people, who becomes a vampire, who is socially anxious and better with numbers than people, and now has to deal with needing blood every now and then. Is that tax deductible? Uh, it is not because he was buying it illegally, but it is now <laughs> in the later parts of the series. Have they like opened up shops and legalized it in Colorado and Washington? Is that how it works? Oh God, I should have done it that way. That would have been better. <laughs> uh, no, he just gets a little deeper into the parahuman world and finds out about assets he wasn't previously aware of and becomes a better accountant for it. He's now a certified public parahuman accountant. All right. Well, if you need your taxes done and you're a vampire, I guess you know who to go to. Exactly. All right. So you kind of told us what the podcast is about. Did you start that at all thinking this is a way I could promote my books or is it just purely for fun? And has it helped you at all with promoting your books? I think originally the idea was that it would be fun. Um, but, you know, when we were constructing the basic idea, we did think of the idea that if, you know, if we got other fantasy authors, not only would that make for a really fun game, but it would also give us the ability to cross promote. So it all sort of stemmed from me and Robert Bevan uh, being drunk and chatting one night and coming up with the idea that, you know, we've had some really crazy games. And if we did one that was comedically structured, we could probably have a lot of fun with it. And so we sort of went from there and then we hit on the idea of doing more authors since we knew a bunch and it just sort of snowballed. And how has the reception been? Are you getting quite a few downloads? Uh, I have no idea what's good for a podcast, but we're growing. So that's probably a good thing. And we've got an awesome, dedicated community um, that shows up every week for our live chats and to do the Q&As that we host at the end. And uh, it's just, you know, really awesome. So we're having fun and it looks like everybody who listens is having fun. And I think that's really the most we can shoot for. A community is good. A lot of people do not get that. I don't know if we have a community that we've really fostered that much, but I don't know if we're that fun either. We're just uh, kind of like the PBS of podcasting for sci-fi authors. Are you finding this any, you know, I guess people always kind of wonder, they hear, oh, you should build a platform as an author. And, you know, there's a the thought that maybe podcasting could be a part of that. Uh, I think when you do like what we do for other authors, it's maybe not going to do a lot to sell your fiction, but it seems like you might be more appealing to people that buy fantasy and science fiction and are readers. Do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, you call yourself the PBS, but there's nothing wrong with PBS. Education <laughs> is a good thing to have. And, you know, um, I don't know what the what the reception would be for like a large group, but I've talked to several authors who all have mentioned like listening to y'all's podcast. So it's I'd say you guys are more of like a targeted audience. You know, it might not help push a lot of books, but it definitely helps spread knowledge. And especially in this industry, that is very helpful for a lot of people. 
We do try to be helpful. We're not famous when we show up at Walmart yet, but we're working on it. But do you do you think for like a new author who's struggling to, uh, you know, get noticed out there with so many other people publishing now, could a podcast be a way to spread the word about their books if they kind of targeted the same audience as might be readers of their books? I mean, I'm sure it could be. Uh, I'm absolutely positive there's somebody out there who has made a great uh, living using the synergy of podcasts and books. I don't know that it would be a great immediate resource, but I would say that if they had an idea for a podcast they wanted to do that they genuinely enjoyed the idea of, I would say chase that. And if it happens to click well, then you can help build your book with it. But knowing how much work goes into podcasting, I wouldn't say to pick it up as like necessarily a purely marketing move because it's going to be a lot of time and a lot of energy. And for pure marketing, if it's not something you enjoy, there's probably better ways to spend your time and money. All right. That makes sense. I think one of the appealing things about podcasting is because it is harder to do. There's probably less competition out there, I would guess, for any given idea that you have. But you're right. It's definitely a commitment. And if you're not you know, unless it's something that really excites you, it's <laughs> probably easier just to buy some Facebook ads. Oh yeah, the best the best marketing tools you have are the ones that you would do anyway because they're just fun. All right, well, let me pass you to the guys and let them ask a few questions and then we're gonna jump into some more marketing stuff a little later on. Yep, um, all right, so you talked a little, a little bit about this earlier, but like, when, you come, when it comes right down to it, basically every book with any level of action in it is a superhero book. I mean, you talk about like a paranormal fantasy is largely about someone acquiring supernatural powers and becoming awesome as a result. So uh, you writing, you know, books of, of uh, you know, fantasy, superhero and satire and all that, when you're brainstorming ideas, what sort of determines where that, what series that, that idea is going to go in for you? Oh man, sometimes it's a matter of genre. Um, so for example, if it's supernatural in nature, it's almost definitely gonna go toward the Fred series. Or if I think I'm going to, you know, maybe throw a different supernatural thing down the line, I'll put it aside for one of those. Superheroes are a little tougher, uh, especially because I'm now, I've written, I have a superhero world, but that's culminated in a couple of series. So they're superpowers. And then I had a spinoff book called Corpies. And then now I'm going back to the well with another superhero series, but set in a different world. So I have gotten a little more stalwart about how I allocate my characters there. Um, and the general rule has been that if, if it fits really well within the context of like a, a younger environment, like a school environment, it's okay for superpowers. Um, and for that, I mean like superpowers that are cool in concept, but need the ability to grow and be tested and be explored. Um, so ones with that might not seem cool off the bat, but have potential to grow and applied well, that's that's more of a superpowers one. Um, if it's one that's a little more developed, uh, you know, maybe it's only fun when it's fully fleshed out, that's when I'll look at throwing that, well, at the time, Corpies are now uh, putting it toward Forging Hephaestus. So it's sort of a matter of mixing the classification, be it supernatural or superhero, and then the general tone and how I think it can best be explored. It's 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 good to know. I like I also like that uh, having multiple superhero series, having to subdivide specific like this is a superpower, but how interesting is a superpower? I love that like you sort of have a place for all of the different potentialities. Uh, it's also, by the way, uh, if we do have a community for this show, then they will know that I'm going to mention I wrote a superhero book and it is satire. So we both have done both of those things. I suspect you've had a greater degree of success than I have with that particular. Uh, section of literary exploration. But uh, just wanted to throw that in there because I'm going to talk a little bit more about it. Uh, I see from your site you have uh, a few links for superpowers, including a Patreon link. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's doing reasonably well. So how are you using that to help your writing? Well, it's generally just supporting uh, me. So I do this full time. And one of the things I, I tell people when they ask about like when to shift off of your day job into writing full time is that a lot of being an indie writer is about generating multiple small streams of income and just sort of gathering together them until you have enough to actually live off of. So, you know, it's Patreon and it's advertising and it's book sales and it's uh, some of the smaller things like donations for bonus chapters. And so Patreon's sort of just one 
stream that goes into the river that allows me to pay the rent. Yeah, that's something that I've certainly we certainly uh, picked up on a lot when people go full time in like a digital realm like this. Like you talk about how hard it is to do podcasting as an income. A lot of like I know a lot of YouTubers who, uh, like for example, YouTube makers who will have a Patreon. They'll also sell uh, the things that they make, or they'll sell the uh, plans to make things. Like it, the uh, well, you, and you're wide as an author, so it, clearly you understand the value of having many many baskets for many many eggs. Um, and like, what are your sort of perks for that? Uh, so my Patreon is fairly limited since I mostly added it at, um, reader request for some sort of back end stuff. So I do a Q and a specialized for them every month. Uh, I do sneak pre, uh, sneak peeks into the works. Uh, I think I do that quarterly. Um, they've just passed a threshold where I turn one blog every month into an audio blog and they get to vote on that and get access to it early. And man, what else do I have on there? Sometimes if I just have random fun things or little tidbits that I think the readers will like, I'll always put them on the Patreon first. And if they make it to the page, it'll be a while later. And a lot of them don't end up making it to the main page. So it's just a, it's just a neat little place where I can put all kinds of fun ideas and thoughts and stuff that I think the people who are that interested would like to have access behind the scenes. That's cool. And really anything that uh, uh, we've, we've spoken in the past, how once people sort of invest their money in something, they are literally invested in it. And it, I feel like this is a sort of situation where, you know, you, you uh, develop a very strongly loyal or at least a label for very strongly loyal uh, fans of yours by giving them a little place where they, their special things. Um, and one more question. I asked this uh, of, of another guest that we had who has multiple concurrent series, but particularly since you write longer books uh, and thus don't have as many releases in a year as some of the more absurdly prolific writers we've, we've interviewed, how do you sort of prioritize and, and, and create your release schedule for your various series? Oh, so um, I have a pretty straightforward formula on this. Um, there's some deviation based on where projects fall, but in general... I try to do safe, risky, safe, risky, safe, risky. So I'll do uh, a book in an established series, and then the next one will be maybe a standalone or maybe the launch of a new series or um, a spinoff from an existing series. But then I'll go back and I'll do another one of a series that's, again, already proven to sell. So basically I'll do series work, and then I'll do either a riskier title, be it because it's standalone or maybe a series that doesn't have the, quite the same momentum. But I really like being able to still explore and do crazy stuff. I mean, that's part of why I named my publishing company what I did, because I wanted to remember, like, I really liked this character, and even if everybody else hates him, I'm glad I made him. So I like being able to take those risks and have the books that flop. Um, so I always just try to give myself some padding in between. That's definitely sound business advice. Um, uh, I also like that you are willing to take risks on things that you enjoy but necess aren't necessarily sellers. That's not a piece of advice you will often receive, but I think it's probably one of the number one ways to avoid burnout and remain enthusiastic about your job. Uh, you, we, a lot of times like you talk about going, going uh, full time. One of the big problems I find with people who take their, well, I, what's the phrase? When you make your avocation your vocation, you get no vacation. <laughs> and we get a lot of people who show up who, who are like, well, you know, now I write full time, but now it's a job and I've lost my, my thrill for it. So it's good to know if, you, uh, if you're able to keep an eye on what sells and what doesn't, you can toss in something just for you sometimes. Absolutely. And you're right. I don't know that it's business advice I could give anybody else. But in terms of like the artistic creative side, I think being able to turn out something that you love, but you don't know if anyone else is going to like is important sometimes because it just sort of reminds you of what you're doing it for. I definitely agree. And my uh, literary oeuvre would bear that out. <laughs> uh, but, uh, that's all I have for this section. So I'll hand you off to Jeff for a few more. <clears throat> All righty. All right, Drew, my first question for you would be regarding your picture. And for those of you that are actually listening to the podcast, you know, Drew's picture shows a, him in a pensive position wearing a hat that looks like it's holding two beers on either side. So my first question would be, is that your riding hat? That's, uh, that is not my riding hat. That's my post writing hat, we'll say. Uh, for anybody <laughs> curious, it is on my Amazon page. It's my official author photo. It's pretty much all over my everything presence. Your your official author page. Okay, so does that mean on the, do you have print editions for your books? I do. 
Is that the picture that's on the back of the book? No, it's inside the back cover. I uh, oh, okay. <laughs> I didn't quite feel like I had quite the gravitas to put myself on the cover yet, but working there. <laughs> All right, so you've got multiple series under your belt. Do you have any idea how many titles you'll release in each series? Not for all of them. Um, in fact, I've only reached the end with one of them, and that is Superpowers. I'm currently uh, doing year four as a web serial right now, as all the previous ones have been. And when that concludes, I'm going to publish it out, just like the others, and that will be the end of the Superpowered series. I'm not going to say it's the end of that world, but that series will have come to an end. So how do you determine when is the best time to start a new series? Oh, God, I don't know. I, I'm terrible at that. I've got way too many series going right now. Are you kidding? <laughs> yeah, I, I'm always curious as I you know, try to, you know, if it's a good cash cow, do you keep milking it for all it's worth or, you know, to make sure you don't burn out, pick a new series or just try something new and, you know, and get the creative juices flowing again. I've always wondered about that. And that's, now that I know you've got a bunch of them, I was just looking for your take on it. Oh, well, as far as when to start a new series, I think it's when you have the idea and when you write it and, you know, when you've got the fire is always good. As for when to end a series, um, I'm a big believer that you should always go in with, if not a final game, maybe at least an end point in mind. Like, where do you want the series to head toward? And, you know, once you're kind of further in, you can actually start fleshing that out and build a full-fledged finale. And then you can start building all the scaffolding that will lead to it through the series. Um, so for superpowers, I've known since probably midway through the first book that this was going to be a four book series, uh, paralleling the four years of college. And <laughs> when, you know, when they reached the end of that, I had to end it because I had my end in mind. I still have my end in mind and I'm building toward it. I think the hard part is when you have an ending, you know, you need to do, um, but you find success. Sometimes it's really tempting to pad things out a little bit or maybe stretch it beyond what it should. But. I don't know. I'm I'm a pretty firm believer that if you stick with a strong ending, it makes the whole series better retrospect retroactively. Um, and if you flounder an ending, it can sort of taint people's enjoyment of what came before. So I'm really trying to stick with my ending. We'll see how that goes. <laughs> I mean, I'm ending it, but we'll see if people like it more. <laughs> okay, so you've obviously you've mentioned that you're a devoted superhero fan. You've created a superhero world and written multiple titles, so I'm willing to bet you've read other books in the superhero genre. So my question is, in your opinion, what would be some common mistakes you've seen other authors make in that genre that could have been avoided? So since I've been writing this for a really long time, I've actually tried to avoid a lot of other superhero hmm. books um, because uh, source memory is such a pain and you never want to accidentally steal from somebody. And when you're going for like, I've been writing this since 2008, 2009. So when you're coming up on a decade, it's really easy to read something and forget. There are a few I've read though, and I think one of the biggest problems I've seen is that people uh, tend to do a lot of what we're seeing in the movies, which is they rush past the small moments, especially for powerful characters. And that that's a critical failing because it truly lessens the enjoyment of the whole tale. Like a lot of people mistake Clark Kent as this weird offshoot, like, oh, you know, you have to make something interesting about Superman or give him some like comedic moments. But the truth is that Clark Kent is the only part of Superman where we can actually see some humanity in him. Like Superman's never going to fail when the stakes are high. We know that as comic book readers or as movie goers, but you know, in the small moments as Clark, he can make sacrifices. He can lose things that are important to him. He can suffer for what he does. And those are real genuine moments. And I feel like a lot of people like to skip past that and go right for the action. And without that emotional foundation, it's not as fulfilling. It's sort of what we're seeing with the DC backlash in terms of a more cinematic example. Very, very true. Yeah. I won't go into spoiler alerts when it comes to Batman v Superman, but <clears throat> anyways. Okay. So, Another question for you, since you've got you know, multiple series, how do you handle the front or back matter in your books? Do you openly advertise each series in the other, even if it's not in the same genre? Oh, definitely. I do a list of book, other books by Drew Hayes with pictures and links and everything since it's ebooks. And um, it helps a little, I think. It makes people aware that I'm doing a lot of different genres and that there's a lot of other options. And hey, if you liked this, why not try that? So I've never really shied away from advertising the fact that I write in a wide spectrum. I don't think I knew I was supposed to when I started. And by the time I found out, I was already kind of committed. So I was like, eh, I'm just going to bear this out. 
Now, do you, do you typically put like other titles by this author in the front or the back? Always the back. Um, cause I feel like generally like that's when you're the hungriest is cause when I finish a book that I really liked, I'm immediately like, Oh, is there more in this series? Is there another one? Or if there's not another one, is there more by this person? Because I really enjoyed this. And I know for me, that's when I'm at my most inclined to go look at other works. So I, I only have myself to go on. So, well, no, that's, that's very true. I mean, if you, if you read a book, I'll say it's by a new author and you enjoyed the book, as soon as you're finished it, you're like, Hmm, let's just see if there's a sequel to this, or let's just see what else this author has written. Cause it sounds like I like his writing style and, and so forth. So perfect. All right. Uh, that's it for my uh, three questions there on this section. Let me go ahead and hand you back to Lindsay. We'll get going on the marketing side of things. All righty. Uh, before we jump into that, I was realizing later, realizing earlier that I didn't ask you what made you decide to go with a small press for one of your series? So with Friend, I decided to go outside of my indie bubble uh, at the time because I really wanted to try working with a publisher. Um, I went small press because I had, oh, what's the word? Oh, I had sort of a project with Fred that I thought was wider reaching than some of my other things. Because I love superheroes, but, and again, 2008, Iron Man was just coming out. We didn't know what the boom was. Um, I thought of superheroes as a little more niche, so I didn't really chase it with that. Um, but with Fred, you know, Urban Fantasy was kind of hot, and I was like, I think I should go with a publisher, and I should see how this bears out. I went small press, uh, mostly because I definitely didn't have the time or the patience to go through getting an agent and going to the big five and, and dancing that whole dance. And I went with Roots specifically because I talked to other authors who had worked with them, and without exception, everyone had spoken about the great way they treated their authors and how we were treated with respect and basic decency. And in a time when you have publishers closing their doors without warning, that was really important to me. And did you just kind of email them out of the blue, or was it you knew them from somewhere else? Or? No, I, uh, I, they had a, they have open submissions. It used to be all the time. Now I think it's for a predefined window of a couple of months, but back then it was whenever. So I just sent in the submission to them, and within a few months they requested to see the whole thing, and I sent that, and then they decided to publish. Do you feel like, I mean, I don't know, at that time, did you have success with your other books? Did that sway them at all? I honestly don't know if it swayed them or not. I was already working full-time as an author with my indie projects. Uh, I'm Well, I'll say that by the time Fred was published, I was working full-time. I think I was when I submitted, but I honestly don't remember the timeline that well. Um, so it might have been that I had a little bit of momentum from the other books. Um, it might have been the book itself. It is actually... At this point, I think it's historically my best-selling book, so it might have stood on its own. I don't know. I was not in the room. <laughs> All right, cool. And what have you found with working with them? Have they brought more to the table than you could have on your own, or what's it? Have they done paperbacks and things like that? They've definitely brought a lot. They had uh, more marketing, more staff, you know, more editing. I didn't have to do everything out of pocket, and I didn't have to run everything. It was uh, a little more hands-off, which was new for me, especially when you come from the self-published world. Um, but it was really nice. It definitely had a broader reach than what I had at the time, probably a broader reach than I have now, I'd say. They, they definitely got it out into more avenues, and it's actually thanks to Roots um, and working with a, you know, an actual uh, press that added a little more legitimacy to what I was doing at the time and got me approached by Tantor. Um, I don't know that I necessarily agree that you have to have a small press to get legitimacy from some avenues, but some people are always going to view that as a little more of a reliable bet, whether you like it or not. All right, cool. And then let me ask what I was kind of wondering in the beginning when uh, I mentioned that it sounds like you're publishing three novels a year, you said, although long novels, so <laughs> you're working quite a bit. So you're not publishing all the time. You're not sticking to one genre as, as often advised. How did you get the ball rolling? How did you get all these sales and build up such a reliable audience there over a few years? So the story on that one is very circuitous and a little weird. But so um, to start off, Superpowers began and still is, as I mentioned, a web serial. Have, have y'all had anyone on who's done that before or do I need to walk through that? Um, you could definitely tell us, I think most people are going to be familiar with, with what it is, but I don't think we've had a guest that started 
that way to build an audience. Okay. Um, so for anyone out there listening who's not familiar, a web serial is just like a web comic where you would go, you know, let's say Penny Arcade, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you would show up, there would be new comics. Same premise. It's a book and every day, depending on what that author has scheduled, you show up and there are new chapters in that book. So originally I was doing superpowers as a web serial and then I finished year one and I started on year two and some readers asked me to put together an ebook version of year one simply for ease because it's again 200,000 words and scrolling through that on a website can be sort of a pain in the butt. Um, so I did, I made my first cover. Don't ever do that to anyone that they're listening. Please don't ever do that unless you have artistic talent. I don't, it was bad. <laughs> And that that's that's my one big warning I'm gonna give everybody. Pay or, pay for a cover artist if you can. Um, and I put it up on Amazon. And to my surprise, um, it started selling more than just with what I thought my audience was at the time. So that sort of got me interested a little bit. And I was like, oh, okay, well, maybe I should try putting up some other books on there. And that's sort of how I got into the Amazon marketplace. You know, as for how reviews and sales got built up, I give full credit. I could not have done this without the awesome support of my web serial readers who have always been great on releases and getting pushes and um, just being really nice about when they read, they always try to leave reviews. So um, it's definitely been the support of my readers and my fans that have gotten me to this point in my career. And were you just publishing that on your own website or were you using Wattpad or a place like that to publish it and find people. I honestly don't know if Wattpad existed when I started because I mean I started web serials. So Superpowers is my second serial. The first one was a comedic one about a kid winning the lottery, and that was 2007. No, that was yeah, 2007, 2008. Um, so I started out on a little thing called Digital Novelist, which was a little ring of people with sites. And then eventually I moved to my current site and it's just been me the whole time. I, I've thought about going over to Wattpad and everything. Um, but at this point, the web serial, I love it and I love my readers and I love doing it, but it's not a branch of the business. I'm super aggressive about growing. So I don't, it's not worth the time to like try and set up in all these other uh, places and get the exposure yet. Cool. Do you think that it was kind of like that you were early in there early doing a niche that's maybe a little underserved that helped you kind of draw readers to you? Oh, definitely. I did not know that there was a superhero boom kind of rising at that particular time. I just happened to get in and, and write in the genre that was really hot. And um, I kind of did the same thing with NPCs, which was the first of the spell swords and stealth series and is sort of on the riding the lit RPG wave now. Um, so better lucky than good. All right, tip for listeners, see what is up and coming and is underserved and get out there and <laughs> write something for it. Were you uh, publishing, it sounds like, were you actually publishing daily or kind of once a week or how, you know, and were you consistent? Do you think that was important in building up a readership? Absolutely. That consistency is one of the first things like that anyone who starts a web serial really needs to wrap their head around because it's a contract with your reader. You're telling them if you show up at this time, I will have content and you really have to uphold that contract because as soon as you stop upholding it, then they have to wonder, oh, well, will the next update happen? And the one after that, and will they even finish a series? I mean, We've all seen how many abandoned web comics there are out there, and I'm willing to bet there's probably a comparable number of web serials by this point. So the consistency is really big because you don't want to get invested in a story and then not be able to finish the book. I mean, that would be terrible if it happened to you on an e-reader. Um, so yes, consistency is huge. What was the other part of the question? I'm sorry. <laughs> I just asked how often you were publishing. Ah, that was, that was it. Uh, I, okay, I don't remember at the time. I think I was still doing um, two updates a week and the blog. So now I do two updates, two to three, depending on how bonus chapter donations go. But I'll do about two of Superpowered, one of another spinoff called Blades and Barriers, and one of my blog. So I'm putting up content four nights a week. So you're actually still doing it. It sounds like you're. it's still a big part of your... You know, you said maybe it's not the full press goes there, but is it it's something you're still updating? 
Oh, absolutely. Like I said, I'm not necessarily trying to go to all these other places to grow the site, but you know, the site is a huge focus. I, I, I love my readers. I love the community. And, you know, it would be horrible to sort of leave them in the lurch after all the wonderful support they've given. So um, I really prioritize it. I still hit all my daily goals and I'm still pushing through. And it's really good, too, because it's a, a great way to write a giant book is, you know, one chapter at a time. It's, it's like eating a whale, just one bite. So are you kind of putting up rough draft stuff or does an editor go over it first? I, I self-edit. I use a readback program. I do my absolute best. And there are still plenty of typos in the uh, one that goes to serial. But I do hire professional editors to go through it before uh, it ever hits the ebook marketplace. So part of what they're paying for in the $4 is quality and someone much better than me at editing looking it over. Nice. Are you feeling that, are you still like using it to the novels you're actually publishing next? Are you serializing that now on your website or is this separate content? Oh no, it's, uh, so the super powered series always goes up as a, as a web serial before it ever gets published. Um, sometimes I'll do little things like I have a Halloween event that's only on the serial or I've done um, a couple of small stories. Uh, I'll work a spinoff, and then if I feel like the story is good, then it'll go to publishing. But if I don't, then it'll just be a site exclusive. So it, it's sort of a it's a good way to do a mix of both. It's a little reward for the people who come to the serial. They get more expanded content than what's available just online. That's cool. It sounds like it's like a really you've built up this great community this way. Other, you know, instead of just going straight to publishing your books, although it does sound like it probably took a, maybe a year or two to get started before you publish the first one. Oh, years and years. Uh, like I, said, I think I started around 08, and the first Super Powered's book was published, oh, that had to be February of 2013, I want to say, give or take. Yeah, so five years building up the fan base first, that, that probably helps. Right. Well, originally, I never planned on making this a career. It was just a thing I love to do, and like I said, it just sort of snowballed. <laughs> All right, one last question about this. Do you think for anybody that's out there listening now and that is maybe in the process of writing their first book, is this something you would recommend trying or do you think it's maybe with Wattpad and sites like that a real crowded space now, that the web, serializing the fiction on the web? I think there's a lot of merit to it. Um, still, I mean, to still doing serials. If if you're a little bit scared about whether or not you know you you have it, we all have the self-doubt monster. I, I think that's just a general truth about writers. The, oh, am I good enough? There is something to be said about the internet because the internet does not love you. The internet does not care about you. And the internet will not pull punches. <laughs> so um, there's a lot of validity in getting it out. And if you can please a crowd that has no reason to lie to you, it's a nice uh, bit of encouragement to actually take things out. And it's in some ways a little bit like taking it to a big heartless workshop on occasion. Um, sometimes you'll get great support, sometimes you'll get skating criticism, but between the two you'll probably find some things in your writing that can improve and there's always merit in that. I assume it sounds like you have the comments section open or a way for people to give you feedback on each uh, installment? I do. I do keep my comment section open. I keep a pretty tight run on my comment section. I enforce civility at all times. It's it's not a huge thriving hub, but you know, it's always nice to hear from people who are reading the story. All right, great. Well, tell us what your thoughts are on pricing because I I don't know if we mentioned it, but your books seem to be around four ninety nine or five ninety nine uh, for the eBooks, and that's you know a couple dollars more I think than is typical for the indie author. Uh, it does sound like your books are long, but uh, have you experimented with that at all? At all, or what do you? What are your thoughts there? <laughs> I'm gonna be honest. I don't remember where 4.99 came from, and that was my first book. I think. Oh no, it's 3.99. Okay, so the first one was 3.99. Um, I think I was just looking at the indie market at the time, at some of the books I was enjoying, and said, "Well, okay." Those books are about $3, but my book is 200,000 words, and it's double, if not four times, the amount that those are. So I'm going to go ahead and swing for $4. And that sort of became my default since then. Uh, I always pretty much price at $4. Now, if it's an extra long book, even by my standards, I'll go up to $5 or $6. 
Um, and if it's a shorter book, I'll drop it down to like $3. Uh, it's sort of, I sort of set superpowers as my standard. And then, you know, if, if I feel like it's demonstrably more than that, then it's worth cost justifying because it costs a lot more to get edited and proofed and everything. Because if I haven't made this clear yet, I'm really bad and I need good editors. <laughs> they, they are what make me readable. And so, you know, Oh, that costs more because I go through multiple different sessions with multiple different editors. Um, and so part of it's just trying to recoup the investment on that. All right. It sounds good. And it's, I guess, kind of having a fan base going in, you were able to say, this is, you know, this is a fair price. This is what I'm going to charge and, and not feel like, oh, I have to do like 99 cents for the first book or launch at 99 cents so people will give me a shot. Yeah, I, I did not think a lot of things through <laughs> at the time. I just sort of went with what felt right. All right. And it looks like all of your books are wide, uh, not just, you know, we've had a lot of people lately that are doing uh, KDP Select, Kindle Unlimited. Have you, was that just your philosophy from the beginning was to go out to all the stores? Have you experimented with KDP Select at all? What's going on? I, I actually would do Kindle Unlimited for more of my stuff. But unfortunately, their exclusivity clause is a real hitch in the giddy up because, you know, I have all these books as, um, oh, web serials. Wow, I blanked on my, my own word. Uh, I have all these books as, as web serials. And um, that means that Amazon considers that a competing source. So I have to either, so I have to either not go it into Kindle Unlimited or I have to take it off my site, which is just a real jerk move. Now, I did put Superpowers year one into um, Kindle Unlimited for a brief time. I did the three month minimum window when um, all the audiobooks were coming out and I wanted to be able to do some promotions to sort of you know, cross promote and let everybody know like, hey, here's the interest of the book. If you like it, here's the audio stuff and blah, blah. Um, but even with that, I had like, I made a post and I talked to my community and I was like, listen, this is happening. It's only happening for three months and then it's coming right back to the site. It's a temporary measure. And so I, I, I don't mind, uh, Kindle Unlimited from a lot of perspectives. I think it's gotten a lot better than it used to be, especially with the price per word change. But that exclusivity thing is just, it's a killer for me. And, uh, and basically until it lifts, I'm sort of my hands are tied on how much I can use it. Yeah, that makes sense. I, uh, I have one series in there and I remember thinking, oh, I might be able to put the first book on Wattpad to you know, stir up the interest before I actually publish it. But then I thought, well, I just have to take it down right away. So yeah, how, how much good would that do? All right, last question for me. As an established author now, uh, you have a new book coming out here. Let's see if I can get the title, if I can say it. Forging Hephaestus, Hephaestus? Forging Hephaestus. All right. Can or you might it? be right. It's Greek. I, I could be uh, wrong. Yeah, my <laughs> I mean... Greek, not real good. <laughs> but um, it's coming out. It's going to be the first one in the Villains Code, book one in the Villains Code series. So what does it look like for you? What are you planning to do for your launch? Or have you ever started stuff? I, I noticed you've got it on pre-order already. Um, I've got the pre-order up. I actually, because I wrote this, so I actually wrote, finished this in 2015. Um, but because of just tight scheduling stuff, I haven't been able to get it out yet. And it was really big. I mean, it's 300,000 words and I just didn't have a spot for it in 2016. So I got it all edited and polished up and, um, I was able to work with Tantor, the audio company, and they're actually going to do a simultaneous release, which is really hard for me on the schedule I run. So that's one, um, I did ARCs for the first time, advanced reader copies. I've never actually done those before. And I um, sent some digital ones out to stir up interest. I'm doing um, a couple of interviews and stuff like that. I think this is my only podcast though. So y'all are special. And uh, let's see. Oh, I'll do my usual digital celebration uh, release where I do trivia and prizes and I end up taking a shot a lot of shots because I have a tradition where whenever a five-star review comes in on release day, I take a shot uh, and post a picture. And uh, that's fun marketing because it's it's a way to remind people, hey, I have a book out, but not seem like I'm being pushy. Um, and that one actually wasn't originally marketing. I just did it and then the fans found out and then they tried to kill me once. So 
Oh, goodness. What else is there? Blog. Um, oh, I've got a drink along power hour that we're filming this week and releasing next week that's going to be superhero themed. So a lot of stuff kind of scattershotting here. All right. I have not heard the uh, drink a shot for every five star review plan before. I'm beginning to see why you have the beer hat on, though. It's on brand. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like a good idea, though. And for those who are listening, if you're curious, the book is at $4.99 and selling pretty well for pre-order. So I, I just want to say I'm encouraged by the fact that you're selling your books at full price, you're wide, and you're doing well. Because <laughs> so many people, you know, right now, and we're the same way, we're like, you know, to have a good shot, it's probably good to go into KDP Select and do KU. And, and uh, you know, we're... The, we also have problems with the exclusivity thing, as I'm sure all authors do. So it's great to see someone who's not doing it and is doing well. And let me Thank pass you. it to Joe. <laughs> <laughs> Waiting for the handoff. Yep. Um, OK, so you write long books. Um, and you mentioned that like a lot, of the, a lot of them start off as a web serial. And that's a good way to write a long book. I feel that's true not only in that it is an effective way to write a long book, but it's also an effective way to make a book long. Because I've found from my own experience, I did a little bit of web serial stuff, and it it produced a fairly long output. So, um, do you find that you're gonna that you're writing too length, or do you feel that you just write a book until the story is done? Like, which which is your prefer preference? I think in the beginning, I might have leaned a little toward writing to length because I had um, chapter word minimums that I had to meet for the serial self imposed, but. As time has gone on, I think I'm a lot more in the mindset of just writing until the story is done. I, I've I've had a lot of them get out from under me. I mean, Forging Hephaestus was actually a writing exercise. I started uh, when Superpowers Year 3 was done. I was like, I have had this idea in the back of my head forever. I've got like two months where I don't need to write anything and I'll still be on deadline. And so I just like, I'm going to just try writing this for me, for fun. And then I got like 100,000 words in, and I'm like, I'm going to have to publish this to cost justify it. I'll get to 150. 300,000 words total. Uh, it, it just sort of it got out from under me. But there was never a point where I felt like I was writing to pad. I felt like I was writing because like this is what comes next. And I think as long as you've got that, you're probably OK. Like That always feels good. I mean, my last Spell, Swords, and Self book it ran way longer than any of the other two. And I don't know if four is going to be as long, but just because there was a lot of story to tell. And I was like, yeah, you know what? Who cares? Like, if it's as long as it is, it's as long as it is. As long as it's good, I think people will be cool with it. Yeah, I have to agree. Um, and it seems to me that you and I end up with books in quite the same way, because I also have had a writing exercise become a thing that I had to publish in order to justify the time and, and work that went into it. But um, you, I was on, I was on your site, and you have an article about uh, how um, advances are starting to, to to vanish from from traditional publishing, and uh, people should definitely go to your site and read that article because it was interesting. But one of the points you make is that uh, a big advance invests a, a publisher in your book and sort of makes them more likely to push it so they can make their money back. And now that the, uh, the big advances are going away, do you think that that's an indicator that even traditional uh, authors are going to have to start using indie author marketing methods just because there's going to be fewer traditional marketing methods being used on their books? I mean, I think that's already kind of true to an extent. Uh, I, I'm not going to put words in other people's mouths, but I, I've talked to a lot of other authors and pretty much to a man or woman, it's a lot of us are just responsible for bearing the onus of our own marketing. I mean, yes, they will take out ads and they will, and a publisher will, you know, maybe do a, a blog tour, but how effective is that compared to a strong social media presence and um, just being constantly visible and available as necessary? It's, I feel like the real shift is that a lot of it has fallen more on the author than it used to. I, I had a, I don't even honestly remember where this was. It was just a meeting with a couple of authors, and one of them goes, God, I wish I could go back to the days when you wrote a book, and that was it. Because she hated social media, but it's just a built-in expectation nowadays. Yeah, it's it's funny. like it, And it's pervasive, not just in, in, in literature, but everything, where it seems like the size of your platform uh, dictates where you can go as opposed to the where you've gone dictating the size of your platform. It's a little bit you know upside down these days. Um, and I got one more question in this section, uh, also to do with your site. And uh, alongside the the uh, 
Patreon link that I saw. I also see you've got a TV tropes and a wiki for the superpowers. Um, do you maintain those yourself, or is that a result of your uh, uh, clearly established community? Uh, no, those were both community driven, but I found them and I thought they were cool. And like, I've always liked TV tropes. So I was like, well, if anybody's wondering if it's there, I'll put a link to it. It just seemed like a nice way to, especially like to nod and recognize the effort that they'd put in in building those. Absolutely. And TV tropes is, a, is a, an addictive website, I have to say. And, oh my uh, God. <laughs> it'll, it'll eat a weekend. I mean, I go there some, I've sent someone there. I, I should not have because that was dangerous, I'm sure. But I sent someone there who was asking specifically about uh, genre tropes for, so that they could sort of read up on what people are expecting. And it's, I, I didn't even think about it until that moment how incredibly useful it is as a research tool. But also, I'm sure there are people who are doing discovery. Like, oh, that's a really cool usage of that trope. Who wrote that? And suddenly, now you're sort of in their radar. So it seems like um, an interesting way, like, you know, sort of subversive marketing. We've also mentioned on the show, speaking of the wiki, um, sometimes it's useful, like, what have I said? I write a book to get it out of my head, and readers read a book to get it into their head. So once the book has been consumed, chances are the reader has got a more encyclopedic knowledge of it than the writer. And I very much wish that, that uh, there was a separately maintained wiki of some of my stuff just for the sake of reference, just to speed up writing future projects on older projects. So I feel it's, it's great that you have fostered a community that's that interested and are able to maintain that sort of thing for you. Oh yeah, they're great. And you're definitely right about having an external wiki being useful. Cause I mean, when you write long books, you get big casts and sometimes it's like, Oh God, do I want to really want to dig through all this? Let's just see if somebody put it in the wiki and then I can double check it. Oh yeah, absolutely. If, where, where people came from, eye colors, just little things like that. You, you, uh, you, the last thing you want is to have a continuity error on something so small that you could have checked, but just couldn't find. Exactly. All right, well, that's all I have for this section, so uh, I'm going to hand you off to Jeff, and uh, he'll ask you the last set. All righty. So I have a question for you regarding mailing lists. Do you have multiple mailing lists for your all your different genres, or do you have just one list that binds them all together? Sorry, bad reference. So you have just one master mailing list that handles all of them? I just have one. I have a new release mailing list. A, hey, if you like my books and you want to know when a new one's coming out, I will send you an email about that. And that's pretty much all, been the only one I've ever ever had. And so you just use that for everybody. That's actually a good way to do it. How do you? What's your best method you've come across for inc inciting people to sign up? Do you offer any incentives? I've actually never really tried. I just uh, put it on there as what I thought was like a nicety for the readers, so that they would get a reminder. It's uh, it's never been a really part I pushed very hard. Very cool. That's and consequently, I'm sure it's much smaller than most authors. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no worries. All right. You mentioned that other authors feel that becoming involved with social network is now becoming a prereq for becoming an author. What social networking platforms do you utilize? And have you found any more, any of them to be more beneficial than others? Uh, I use Twitter and Facebook and Snapchat. And... I guess I have the most fun with Twitter, I would probably say. It's, uh, it's a little more fleeting. You can do a little more. Like with Facebook, it's hard to do multiple posts and not feel like you're spamming, um, <laughs> even if it's not book related. But with Twitter, like you can throw out some jokes or just some funny things. You can give people updates about your day and you know about your writing process, and it doesn't feel as intrusive. So I'd say I probably get the most mileage out of Twitter. Um, in terms of effectiveness, I really could not say. <laughs> yeah, it's the most fun for you. Is that it? Yeah, it's it's the most fun. So it's the one I where I spend the most time, and because it's the most time, it's the most fun. It's it's one of those cycles. <laughs> so conversely, are there any platforms you actively avoid? You know, I don't do Instagram just because I don't take enough pictures of things, and I don't know that I'd really have value to contribute there. And uh, as the years roll on, and it gets more and more like established, I'm like, I'm gonna have to make an Instagram account, aren't I? <laughs> Yeah, see, I, I actually have an Instagram account, but I have yet to really figure out what I should be doing that that might try to help boost sales without coming across like a damn spammer. It was like, hey, come buy my book. Do you like these kind of books? Come buy it. I was like, I, I just don't like doing that. So as, as soon as I figure, tell you what, if anyone out there figures it out, let me know, would you? <laughs> but Okay, and my final question, have you had any experience in using Facebook ads or Amazon ads or, or what ads do you use or do you even use any? 
I used Project Wonderful ads way back when the serial was first starting. And that was pretty much it. I, I've never been a big advertising guy. Some of the people in the Authors and Dragons group know a lot about it. And it's absolutely something I've always like wanted to learn more about. And so it's one of those things that you're like, boy, when I have the time, I am going to learn that. And then you just never find the time. <laughs> yeah, because we're always we, yeah we're always looking for the magic formula for like the Facebook ads or the Amazon ads. Like, okay, someone someone did this and hit this magical selection and it worked wonders. And we're always inquiring, and yet no, everyone always says the same thing. Like, yeah, you know, it's, it's fifty fifty. Some says, yeah, it works pretty good. Others like, yeah, yeah I don't really see a good ROI on it. So what's the point? But um, oh well. But, uh, but all right, here's the one thing I have. Learned. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, yeah, no. Go ahead. I was going to say, so the one thing I have learned from uh, people who do know about Facebook and Amazon ads is um, that they will consistently tell me what works for you may never work for anyone else. And what works for you on month one may never work again. It, it's You sort of have to accept that there's a certain amount of circumstances all hitting together at once to create like big pushes and you can't necessarily capture that lightning in a bottle. You have to accept that there's a little bit of chance in your algorithm. Okay. I mean, that makes sense. Because yeah, then again, yeah, if someone says, okay, I'm a fantasy author, I also do this, and here's how I tailor my ads, and you're like, okay, well, I'm in the superhero genre. I've also got some of these other, and that formula does not work for me. So, yeah, it's all relative. <laughs> But um, yeah, yeah. Uh, all righty, that's it for my marketing questions. Let me hand you back over to Lindsay and see if we can get this thing wrapped up for you. Sounds great. All right, cool. We had a couple people watching live, which we appreciate, and they had a couple questions. And I should say, when I said before we don't have much of a community, it's because we really suck at making it it easy for people to find the show. And like a good podcast host would have the link up a few days ahead of time and uh, make it easy for people to find stuff. But we're not that good <laughs> or skilled but anyway back to drew the 48 cats asks um early when you were talking about publishers are closing their doors without warning what did you mean by that oh um there have been just in general a couple of small presses over the last year or so who have uh, suddenly announced that they were going out of business and sometimes they'll give the rights back and sometimes they won't. I don't know if this is, is necessarily makes a lot of waves in the general internet, but because I follow a lot of other indie and small press writers, um, when something like that happens, it sort of blows up my social media feed. So it, it's something I get a lot of visibility on. Um, and it, it does happen. I mean, publishing right now is a risky industry. Yes, the big five are probably going to stay solvent, but there's a lot of smaller people cropping up who might not necessarily last uh, through the next year. And so uh, choosing who you trust with your work is really important. Right. And uh, when I got started, it was the big six. And uh, <laughs> people who started a while ago, I'm sure there were more. So it's definitely, I feel like it's also getting harder and we're seeing consolidations and businesses having to close their doors. Except Amazon, <laughs> which has got like 70% yeah. of the market share or something. All right. Yeah, publishing is an upheaval right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, it's a good time if you can move quick and take advantage of things, I guess. All right, um, last little question, and I'm not sure if uh, Sanji was actually asking this to you or just <laughs> throwing it out there, but he sounded kind of he or she sounded surprised that uh, web serials are popular, or are they popular, or do you feel like you just kind of created something unique? Oh no, there's definitely a market for uh, web serials. I mean, the rise of things like Wattpad is sort of proof of that alone, um, and there's tons of very successful ones out there. Um, there's a whole website called topwebfiction.com that's dedicated toward ranking them and that's all user generated. I mean, in terms of like the size of the internet, it's probably not a huge community, but it's definitely its own little continent and it's got a, got a lot of people who really enjoy them. Yeah. And I don't know exactly with your audience how it goes, but I know like we've heard from interviews with Wattpad people that you get a lot of the younger people who maybe don't have credit cards yet and can't just go buy ebooks on Amazon or they don't have much income yet. So that free fiction is, is awesome, you know? 
Oh yeah, I got into web fiction when I was uh, stuck working at a desk job and had literally like I would could only visit so many kinds of sites because it was that kind of company. And so I just started reading online books for a long while. And then finally I was like, I wonder if I could do this. It turns out I could. <laughs> All right. Well, why don't you finish up by telling us where people can find you? And, you know, you got a new book coming out if you want to give us a little spiel on what that's about. Sure. Um, you can always find me on Amazon, of course. Drew Hayes. I am not the one who wrote comic books. I should be the first one who comes up. I'm also not dead. I, that gets asked a lot. I don't know how to change when Google brings that up. It brings up the wiki entry for the gentleman who passed away and my picture. And I've not found a way to change that. Um, you can <laughs> read all the web serials and all the bonus stuff and all the various things uh, at drewhaysnovels.com, H-A-Y-E-S, ha, yes. Oh, that's a terrible joke and I make it every time. Uh, <laughs> and as for the new series, uh, Forging Hephaestus is the story of a thief who accidentally tries to rob a guild of villains and ends up getting sucked into their world because she can either prove she has a value to the group or she can get killed because they're villains and that's how they roll. Um, and it's sort of, so Superpowers was a me looking at superhuman abilities through the lens of like, okay, well, what if we did like a semi-realistic world? And Forging Hephaestus and the Villains Code series is very much a comic book world. It's really meant to be a take on that. And um, there's some satire and then there's a little bit of rewriting. And I don't know, it, it's just, it's meant to be a little more fun, a little more bombastic than what I can get away with in previous novels. So if you've liked Super Powers and but you've wanted to see like what I would do with like a real old school comic world, this is pretty much that. All right, sounds fun. And bonus points for using the word bombastic. Oh, thank you. Joe used something earlier. I forgot what it was, but I was going to Google it and then I got distracted. Ouvre. It's kind of hard to spell. Is it French? Is it an H? <laughs> oh, it's like an O E R V R E oh or goodness. something like that. It's crazy. All right. <laughs> That's right. We got smart guests on this show. So thanks for listening. And Drew, thanks for coming on and telling everybody lots of great information. Um, this will be episode 118 at marketingsff.com. If you want to get any of the links that we mentioned, I'll put them in the show notes. Or if you just want to come by and leave a comment, we would appreciate it. Thanks for listening, everyone. Thanks for all the info, Drew. Nice to meet you. Thanks for having me, guys. So long, everybody.